What's up guys, it's Alex the Magician here, back for another Heroes 3 battle guide. And in this one, we are going to be addressing a request that I've gotten a few times on previous videos, and that would be how to kite. So we are going to be discussing and demonstrating kiting in combat. So there's quite a few things that I want to say about it and quite a few things that you kind of have to keep in mind to be able to kite properly. I'll try to cover those. And one thing is you need to kind of understand that this is not really like a thing that works in 100% of cases exactly the same way because the situations are going to be different. You're going to be facing different variables. And sometimes, you know, the AI will behave in a way that you don't quite expect um, so what you really need to do to learn how to kite properly in combat is to practice and you know just try it out on your own try out the easier fights first and then you know just try to get progressively harder and before you you apply it in a real game situation then you know just uh, make sure that you kind of know what you're doing or at least had some practice and some idea of what you're going to be trying to do when you're facing a fight that would be difficult or impossible to do otherwise. So now that we've said that, uh, kiting is very, very useful in many cases. It's essentially abusing the AI in a lot of ways. And if you can do it, it's one of the things that really kind of separates um, you know, the really top tier players from the kind of okayish or, you know, maybe just casual players, because if you can kite properly, then you can do fights that look impossible in the early game and, you know, later on as well. And really, this kind of becomes one of those things where if you are able to do them, you can gain a huge advantage in terms of tempo, you know, uh, to be able to kill whatever the... Uh, you know, units that you're going to fight are guarding, which, you know, without that, you may not have been able to do it. And then, you know, you don't get like, let's say a cons or a hive or a dragon cave or whatever uh, they're guarding, which would allow you to gain that higher tempo. So let's just go ahead and get into this. Um, first example that I'm going to demonstrate is going to be somewhat straightforward. Uh, we're going to be facing uh, 2049 Swordsmen, right? And we're just going to be facing them. We're doing them with Fortress. Uh, we're going to be using just our day one stacks of uh, Gnolls and Lizardmen and three one stacks of Serpent Flies, right? So a few things that I want to mention before we get into this. You need to make sure. So to be able to kite something properly, you want to have speed advantage, right? So your main power stack needs to be able to outspeed, uh, ideally outspeed or at least tie speed. But if you tie speed, it's a bit more challenging. So ideally you want to outspeed whatever you're fighting, whatever you're kiting, right? So here the swordsmen have speed five and on Dracon on Swamp, our regular gnolls have speed six. So we have that taken care of, right? So that means our gnolls are gonna move first, which allows us to uh, pick them off much more intelligently, right? Now, as far as your kiting stacks go, it's best to use stacks that are even faster. So in this case, we're using Serpent Flies, which have speed 9, 10 on Swamp. That is going to allow us to kite much better and much easier than if we were using like the null one stacks to kite. Also, flying one stacks help. And I would also suggest not using two hex stacks. So like centaurs for rampart or griffins for uh, castle are not the best. Uh, two hex one stacks are not the best to kite with because they're kind of awkward to maneuver. You got to make sure that you're staying away even farther. And in the case of like griffins, you know, they only have speed six. Same with uh, centaurs. You know, you may not actually be able to kite properly with those. So I would say fast one stacks preferably flying and uh, you know something that is one hex. And the other thing that you want to be mindful of when you're doing this is morale. So morale can certainly mess you up. It can certainly make kiting a lot more difficult. And 
what you want to do is, especially at first when you're practicing this, practice against things that either don't have morale or you have an anti-morale artifact like spirit of oppression, hideous mask, whatever, you know, just make sure they have neutral morale. They don't have to have negative morale, but neutral morale is best for kiting. Uh, or, you know, like I said, just go for things that don't have morale like elementals, uh, maybe golems, etc. right? So those few things you want to keep in mind, right? You need to outspeed them with your main stack. You need them to not have positive morale and you need fast, preferably flying one hex, one stacks to kite. So with all of those elements, um, you know, we are ready to go ahead and get into this. By the way, guys, let me know what you guys think about this video in the comments below. Let me know if you found it helpful or not. Uh, you know, always open to constructive criticism. And also let me know um, if you guys want to see something else in, um, in a subsequent video. If I do like the idea, I will very well do it. All right. So let's go into this. All right, so you see there's actually 28 of these um, swordsmen here, and there is an upgraded stack, which makes it a little bit more difficult. Uh, auto combat was still able to do it, but we lost 29 nulls on auto combat. I think that with proper kiting, we would be able to do this better. Now, so as far as kiting goes, the main concept that you want to keep in mind is you want to buy yourself enough time to pick off you know all of these stacks without taking hits or with taking the minimal number of hits on your main power stack right and the way that we do that is two things so we utilize kiting for separation and we also utilize kiting to get the stacks to turn around so we're going to be demonstrating all of those cases so as far as separation goes, you're already kind of thinking about this before you're going into the fight and this first turn, right? So what you want to do is you want to try to isolate as many stacks as possible, uh, you know, to try to get most of them to go in one direction and a couple of them to go in a different direction, right? So here, for example, it would be beneficial for us to have most of them go up and then like two of them to go in this direction so that our nose that can outspeed them can utilize a weight turn and pick off the two stacks without getting hit. And then we kind of rinse and repeat, kite the stacks here back and then, you know, continue to isolate them, right? So that's what we're going to try to do. Now, how do we accomplish that? Well, first of all, we're going to use two serpent flies to move forward already. This way we entice as many of these guys to move this way, right? This other serpent fly and these two gnolls, we're going to actually wait with. And these guys we're also going to wait with so that we can try to utilize them to continue kiting on turn two, three, four, right? That way, so this is already one of the things that you want to keep in mind is weight turns. So in a lot of cases, using weight turns is beneficial for kiting. So for example, like this stack here, let's say, you know, I already had these stacks in this position. Well, I don't have to move them away. I can just wait. These guys are going to move forward and then I can move away, right? So that way I control the positioning that much more. Now, the key concept that you need to keep in mind as you're kiting is that the AI is going to want to move towards the greatest number of targets that they can reach in the fewest number of turns. So just keep that in mind. Uh, so that is what you want to do. And that's why sometimes you want to utilize more than one stack or maybe put, um, you know, here have like a two or a three stack or something like that to uh, kite them properly because they will prioritize that more, right? So what you want to try to do is you want to try to make your main stacks less attractive for them to go for than these, um, you know, kiting stacks. So here, for example, these guys will need three turns to reach my main stacks, right? And here they'll, they'll, they'll reach like these guys may even need four turns, actually one, two, three, four. Yeah. These top guys will need four turns to reach my uh, power stack. And here they'll reach these stacks in two turns. So they like we have a very, pretty good idea that they're all going to go this way. Right. So let's see what happens. 
So like I said, we're going to wait here, right? So the main stack went this way. Wait, 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 wait. All right, there we go. And uh, so we have four of them over here. This one is kind of below, but that should be fine. And actually, the fact that these guys got morale even makes this easier for us. Now we can actually pick off these three stacks without really worrying about the, um, um, you know, getting hit on our main stack because we can pick this one off. Then we can use a wait turn to pick off this one and that one. OK. So uh, we may as well shoot with the lizard men. Doesn't really matter because we should be one shotting the swordsman here. All right. Now the gnolls, I think I'm going to send them up here. I can ignore morale just to uh, show you guys this would be possible. Now this stack we'll just pick off. Just make sure we don't get hit. Right. Boom. This way we can still utilize a wait turn on the next turn and then pick off the stack and that stack without getting hit. Uh, here, one, two, three, four, five. OK, we can put the serpent fly here. Ignore morale and just make sure when you're checking their movements, you know, you stay out of range. So use control because shift. Uh, checks their movement, taking the rest of the stacks into account. And here you see if we check shift, it tells us that they can only move here. But that's taking these two stacks into account, right? But actually, if we use control, we can see that if we move away that stack, then they can move all the way over here. So if we moved here, we would lose our one stack. And that's not what we want to do, right? Now, and the other reason that I am using more one stacks is because I uh, don't have an anti morale artifact here. So in case that these guys do morale, I want to have more one stacks to, you know, still continue to kite. Right. Okay, uh, so now we can wait with the stack. All right, so now we have these guys here. Eh? All right, so Since we're going to be picking off this stack and then that stack, right? I think I'm going to want to have these nulls blocking the Crusaders like so. That way next turn, because they have speed six, they're going to move before my main null power stack. So I don't want them to hit it, uh, right? But this way they're going to be blocked off. So they will not uh, be able to reach our stack that can pick off this stack and that stack. So this turn we wait. And uh, the lizard men can also wait, I suppose. Oh, crap. That was actually <laughs> uh, I messed that up. I messed that up. OK, uh, let's see. In that case. I didn't realize uh, so that was a little bit of a mistake. I didn't realize that the stack was actually going to reach, but I think we can still salvage this. I think what I'm going to do is utilize a uh, serpent fly to block off the crusaders here. Then I'll move the archers here. Okay, now like I said, we can pick off this stack. All right, so now what I'm going to do is move this serpent fly here. That way, the crusaders. OK, then the other serpent fly I'll also use to block these guys off. This is a little bit sloppy just because of that little mistake uh, with, uh, you know, not seeing that swordsman's movement. But that's OK. I think we're still going to be fine. So uh, just to make sure. So this way, these crusaders can still reach our nose just to make sure they don't. I'm going to block them off like this with a serpent fly. And this other serpent fly is going to be utilized to kite these two back. So like that. All right. Or at least one of them back anyways. All right. So now we can actually move this null stack. And what we're going to use it for next is to entice these crusaders to come down. Right. So we're going to actually put them within range. And that's another thing that I'll demonstrate in a little bit more detail later is if you want to make sure that they move in the way that you want them to move. Then you put them, uh, you put your one stacks in range for them to attack, right? So, like if I wanted to make sure that one of these stacks turns around, I could have actually put the serpent fly within range for it to attack. 
So uh, here, what we're going to do is we're going to put this knoll down here, but within range for the Crusader to attack. That way, we're going to isolate him. And next turn, we can pick him off because he's a bit problematic here, right? So we pick off this stack now. Okay. Wait. All right. So we did get this guy to turn around. So that's good. And now this guy is going to come down. Um, we can pick him off with the gnolls after he takes care of this one or after he hits this one stack and uh the serpent fly can just continue to move down the stack will follow it and we should be completely fine so now we pick off this stack all right that stack moves down serpent fly here boom 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 and boom all right and there you guys have it so instead of losing 29 nulls as the auto combat lost we only lost two serpent flies and two nulls actually if i didn't make that one mistake with not seeing the swordsman moving forward uh you know being able to reach that null one stack i think we could have saved the serpent flies as well but still i would say this is a pretty acceptable result and you know here we got a good weapon for it uh so i would say that that was a pretty decent result so there you guys have of that example um i would say that's a decent example of some early game kiting that you guys can utilize to you know really preserve your day one power stack right after this you know we can still we have this weapon now we can also take the uh, you know, so now we have five attack, which is really helpful for Beastmasters. And that means that, you know, we'll be able to do like hives and whatnot easier. So that is really helpful. And our power stack is still preserved. So we really didn't lose much on that. So that is a very acceptable result. Uh, very good uh, early game fight, I would say. All right, so the next one that I'm gonna demonstrate to you guys is going to be uh, kiting with a ranged stack. So this is probably one of my favorites, and uh, you know, utilizing tower, especially when you have some genies to actually buff your gremlins. You know, in the early game, you can do some pretty insanely difficult fights, um, but. What you would like to have in this case is an ammo cart because the Master Gremlins only have eight shots. So ammo carts are usually necessary for fights like this. Now here we're fighting stone golems, 5099 of them, pretty large number. And <clears throat> what we uh, want to make sure here is that we do not fight something that has morale. So if you know, <clears throat> excuse me. If you know that you want to fight something that's really difficult and you really, really, really need to make sure that your kiting works properly, definitely make sure that it's either something that doesn't have morale or you have an anti-morale artifact. So let's go ahead and get into this one. So see, auto combat is not able to do this. And you see it's a large number of them, right? One, two, three, four, five, six. So 66 of them with an upgraded stack. So, <clears throat> but with utilizing proper kiting, we should be able to do this. Now, first round, we're just going to buff the gremlins right away. And then we're going to move the obsidian gargoyles that we're going to utilize to kite. And we also have a five stack of them to try to entice them to move forward, right? So remember, as I mentioned, you want to make your main stacks less attractive and you want to make the kiting stacks more attractive, right? So first round, we're going to utilize the Obsidian Gargoyles to kind of try to control their positioning. And then after that, we're also going to be using the Genies to kite as well to, again, give them the greatest number of targets that they can reach in the fewest number of turns so that they will go for that and uh, leave kind of our gremlins alone, right? Uh, we got morale here, but we're going to ignore it just to make sure that, uh, you know, to show you guys that we're able to do this without morale. And here... I also want you guys to pay attention to the fact that we're using gargoyle one stacks to protect our gremlins. So if we used golem one stacks or more than golem one stacks, again, we're trying to make this less attractive for the AI to go for. So that's why we want just one stacks here. All right, uh, here we're, we're going to wait with the gremlins so that we can use, we can get a straight arrow shot uh, on these golems here that should move forward. All right, just like that. 
Okay, now we'll buff these guys again and get his prayer, kill that guy, and then move the obsidians here. Okay, now we should probably be going for the iron golem stack. And let's see, the genies, I want to move them down um, so that these guys probably follow the genies and the seven um, iron golem stack should not kill a genie one stack. So I can actually put that within range to get hit. But not to die. Actually, this guy can cast again. There we go. Bless is a good one. And now the obsidian gargoyles are going to go back here to hopefully entice some of these guys to turn around. Okay. Well, they actually didn't turn around, but this is fine because they're going to be far away from the gremlins. And now we can use the genies to kite again. All right. So now I just want to move the genies over here. Ignore morale. We could potentially cast here, but I think we're fine. This genie here. So now that we got rid of the um, iron golem, this should be a lot easier. All right. And you see, and this is why like, I'm, I'm utilizing as many stacks as possible to again try to give them more targets over here that they can reach so here they can also reach within two turns and here they can reach with within two turns but i'm hoping that because this is not super attractive for them to only reach this in two turns and still not hit the gremlins right they would turn around and start fighting this or try to fight that and there we go it happened all right, so, and now this is, um, okay, ignore morale here, just to show you guys that we don't even need morale. And now we can pretty much just permanently kite them like this. So no matter their numbers, even if there are like, you know, 99 of them here or something, uh, we would be able to just permanently kite like this. Take off that one stack, just in case, and just rinse and repeat. All right. Now we did get some uh, lucky shots and we got some uh, decent casts, but even if this took longer, like I said, we can pretty much permanently just kite over here. And um, oops, uh, that, <laughs> I actually messed up there. Well, I think um, I think we should be able to do a lot of damage to that one stack. So hopefully it doesn't kill the genie. Yeah, you guys just want to make sure that you do check the movement, right, by hovering over the stacks and uh, pressing shift so that you do stay out of range. Like here, I messed up accidentally and uh, I put this genie within range to attack. That didn't need to happen. But yeah, like that, they do not even kill a one stack. There's Frenzy. All right, so you guys see the fight that is pretty much impossible without uh, utilizing this kiting became much, much easier. And yeah, the other thing that uh, I want to mention is that, you know, when you do face an upgraded stack, like in both of these fights, uh, the, the one with Dracon and this one, uh, it made it a little bit more difficult, right? So you want to make sure that you try to take those problematic stacks out first because they'll have higher speed and they will kind of mess up the coordination of the rest of the stacks, right? However, when utilized properly, this kind of stuff is possible. All right, and then one more that I'm going to demonstrate to you guys. is going to be a dungeon over here. 
and we're actually going to be fighting something that I wouldn't normally do. This is a huge number of ogres because here they're guarding a manticore lair and shackles of war, which is a major class artifact. And it adds 10,000 value to this. So there's going to be a huge number of them. There's probably going to be close to 49 of them. I would not do this in the early game. Don't, I don't recommend doing this. I just wanted to do this for the sake of demonstration to show you guys that with utilizing kiting, it is going to be possible. Whereas without it, you would have died. And here we do have an anti-morale artifact. So, uh, you know, because this is already going to be a difficult fight, even with the anti-morale artifact. With, um, without an anti-morale artifact, this would be pretty much impossible. So, Once again, uh, I don't recommend doing this. And, um, you know, I don't recommend actually <laughs> going for a fight like this. This is just for the sake of demonstration to show you guys what is possible uh, when you utilize kiting. Even a huge number of th like this, like you see, there's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, so 35 plus 12, 47, right? So almost 49 of them. I mean, they're, a, what, a tier 4 unit, and uh, I... Definitely don't think that uh, this is something that you should go for in the when you are only when you only have your day one power stack, right? So this this would be really 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 difficult to do, but let's just get into this. All right, so once again, we're going to be trying to use separation and we're going to be trying to use one stacks. And here I will also demonstrate using the one stacks uh, to actually sacrifice them to make sure that the ones uh, that some of them turn around. So first we're going to wait. All right, and we're already uh, achieving some desired separation over here. So we got these two stacks that we can isolate with our trogs, and then we can try to keep these guys busy. And this is why I kept all six stacks over here, again, to get the greatest number of them to go down here, because there's more targets here, right? So now we're gonna move these guys forward but still stay out of range, right? So that next turn, we can utilize another wait turn and uh, these guys are going to move forward over here. So again, we're going to wait with everybody, right? And nothing can reach. They don't have a chance at morale, right? We do have an anti-morale artifact. And uh, here our goal is to uh, hit this stack and then after a wait turn and then that stack to hopefully kill them and uh, try to take as, as little damage back as possible. Now, another thing that makes this fight kind of problematic is the fact that we don't have enough one stacks to kite and take retaliation, right? So we actually have to eat uh, retaliation attacks because we're likely not going to be one shotting with our, um, you know, 102 troglodytes. So that's another thing, another reason why I wouldn't recommend doing this fight because even when you, if you do this, you will be losing troglodytes. But see, auto combat was not able to do it at all, right? But we should be able to. So again, wait, 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 wait. All right, so now we're going to try to get some of these guys to turn around, pick off these stacks and save a couple of one stacks as well. So I think I'm going to utilize four one stacks here, move two of them back. Now hit here, one HP left. So we can actually utilize one of these uh, harpies to, uh, to kill that. And now we're actually going to sacrifice some one stacks to make sure that these guys turn around because I really don't want them to move forward because I have another stack that I need to deal with here with the troglodytes. And until I do that, I really don't want any of these other guys to uh, come this way to actually hit our troglodyte stack, especially since there's also like a one stack here and likely going to be a one or a two stack left here that can take retaliation and then like a seven stack can hit us without taking retaliation. We really don't want that. So we're going to put this Harpy within range of this Ogre to attack and this one within range for this Ogre. So these two will get sacrificed. And then these stacks are going to be over here to uh, entice these guys to turn around as well. Now here we're going to take out the stack and then wait. Okay, now we attack here. We got morale. We actually will utilize our morale here because, like I said, the fight is already difficult enough as it is. So, um, yeah, we will take any advantage we can get. All right. 
And see, now we got a pretty decent separation here. So now we have one more stack that's isolated over here. We can take that out with the troglodytes after a wait turn, right? Nothing reaches us. These two harpies will die, unfortunately. Uh, we will be using them to kind of, you know, keep two of these stacks back. All right. Um, let's see, move this harpy here. Don't need morale here. All right, here I can just def and move that here and move that here. All right. Uh, now, again, I'm going to wait with this one, Harpy, and wait with uh, the truck. Okay. So now this gets a little bit tricky. Let's see how we can do this. So what we can do here is maybe hit the stack with the trogs and then back up with them. That's probably what I'm going to do, actually. And then the harpies. So this one still moves, right? So I can utilize that one to kite these guys back. And here, yeah, like I said, I'll hit. This harpy will go back here. And this harpy... We'll try to kite over here. Just make sure we don't get hit. All right. So something like this. Okay. And then the trogs should probably back up like that. Okay. Uh, so we actually got all of them to turn around. Not quite what I wanted to do. I wanted some of them to come back this way. But that's okay. I think uh, we can still manage here. All right, this guy moves first. So in that case, let's see. This guy moves first, one, two. Oh, and uh, I do think that so you guys should utilize the battle queue. That way you can tell which one of them moves first and which one of them moves last, which is pretty important. Like in this case, for example, I know that this guy moves first, right? So one, two, three, four. So if I put my harpy over here, he doesn't reach, right? Then the second one is also not going to reach. Likely, they're both going to go for the harpies, right? Then the third one does reach, and that means that this guy is now going to move this way towards the trogs. So we should achieve some separation with that. Okay. Now we're going to wait with the trogs. Cool. So that's what I was talking about, right? Um, now... Okay, we're going to move this guy here. Harpy can move down here. Out of reach, right? And these guys are far away, so we're going to be utilizing the Harpy stock to kind of keep those guys busy. Now we're going to wait once again. So utilizing the wait turn to try to pick off this stack and then that stack. Okay, that's fine. We can hit that stack like so. Uh-huh. So this is problematic because uh, if I move the harpy over here, this stack will likely finish the harpy. So what we're going to need to do is utilize it or like move it up here because we're going to take out this stack with the trogs. And unfortunately, the trogs are going to take a hit from the two stack here, but I don't think we have a choice. We have to eat it. OK, cool. Um, now. Let us try to change their positioning like so. Utilize the harpy to get some of them to move here and the trogs move back. Okay, this is not bad. Um, at this point, however, let's see. There is just no way to save our harpy. So... Uh, we just need to think how we can get the greatest amount of separation from them to kind of try to uh, buy troglodytes enough time to take them off, pick them off one by one. So this guy moves first, right? If we move it down here, this guy here, okay, we'll go here. This guy moves second. He'll move as close as possible down here, and then that guy moves. No. So what we are going to do is we're going to have the harpy here. That's going to buy us the greatest amount of distance between this guy and that guy. 
So that way, hopefully, we can get an unanswered, uh, we can get an attack on this guy and then that guy without actually getting hit by a big stack. <clears throat> so let's try that. Okay, now we're going to wait with the trogs. Uh -huh. So these guys think they're smart. They think they're smart. Okay, but we'll be fine. We should be fine if we just stand over here. Now we can wait. And then I think we have enough distance to hit this stack and then that stack. Yep, perfect. So we hit this stack, and then we hit that stack, and then we hit that stack. <clears throat> Again, at this point, like I said, we are taking some damage, but we just uh, can't really help it. Mm. And we actually could have done that better, I think. I think we didn't have to take uh, a hit with this stack so far, or this turn. But that's all right. Um, one, two, three, four, no. So can we get away? No, I don't think we can. So at this point, we just have to eat some attacks. Well, there you guys have it. So, I mean, obviously, like I said, you don't really want to do this fight. <laughs> so even with that kiting, we still lost half of our troglodyte stack. However, it became possible. So the 47, you know, auto combat was not able to do it. Without the kiting, we wouldn't have been able to do it. But again, I don't recommend it. And I probably could have done it cleaner. I, I probably could have done the kiting cleaner. Um, I'm actually not, you know the best at it but you know i hope that this still gives you guys enough of a demonstration to see that with you know just get the general idea of kiting and then you guys can practice on your own so that is kind of what i wanted to get across in this video so uh, that's everything that I wanted to share. Uh, thank you guys so much for watching. I hope that you guys find this helpful. Uh, let me know what you guys think in the comments below. Maybe if you guys have some questions left over that uh, you know I didn't demonstrate in this video, let me know that as well. I'll try to address those maybe in the comments, maybe in another video. And uh, as always, check out my Twitch stream for more English Speaking Heroes 3 content. Link in the description below. And I will see you guys soon. Peace out.